You're listening to Icebreakers, the podcast exploring all things Canadian and Eurasian, business, culture, and personalities. The series is produced by Serba, the Canada Eurasia Russia Business Association. We're a nonprofit supporting trade, investment, and good relations between Canada and the countries of Eurasia. I'm your host, Nathan Hunt, one of the founders of Serba and former chairman of the National Board. I invite you to tune in regularly for valuable insights relating to the region. I am joined today by a good friend, an old colleague, and a reliable diplomat, Mr. Gilles Breton, who has served three assignments at the Canadian Embassy in Moscow, Russia. His first posting there began during the Soviet period in 1983 to 86, I believe. His last was from 2008 to 2012, where he served as Minister, Counselor, and Deputy Head of Mission at the Canadian Embassy. He also served as Deputy Director Responsible for Canada's Relations with Russia from 2000 to 2008, back in Ottawa. And as an international civil servant, he was Deputy Director of the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights in Warsaw from 1994 to 1997. Most importantly for us, perhaps, he serves currently as the Chairman of the National Board of the Canada Eurasia Russia Business Association association that puts on these podcasts. Uh, so I'm uh, quite pleased to have you with us as, as our guest today, Gilles. I know you're going to regale us with fascinating stories. Well, let's see. Now tell me a little bit, Jill, about your first posting. This was in the heat of the Cold War. This was 1983. How did you even get involved in Russia? What piqued your interest? First thing is that, of course, I was always fascinated by Russia, and so was my spouse at the time. So we were very interested in Russia. And then, of course, as a result of the, the sort of the inner management of foreign affairs in those days, I'd been assigned to work in the legal bureau in a position that I thoroughly disliked. So I was trying to get out of it. And then, of course, when, the only way to get out of the legal bureau at the time was to agree to take position on what was the USSR human rights file, which was regarded as one of the most difficult and unpleasant files because there's not much you could do. And of course, you ended up on receiving complaints about what was going on in the Soviet Union from the many Canadians who had sort of emigrated from that part of the world or and who still had relatives there. So I ended up uh, taking this, what they call, bad job. And then, of course, got interested in things, things Russian again. And of course, as a result of some, it was referred to at the time as pillow talk. I was offered a posting in Moscow. You know, we could get into the details, but of course, I ended up meeting Robert Ford, the person who has served as ambassador of Canada to Russia for 16 years from 1964 to 1980. Rob Ford was the ambassador of uh, Canada in the Soviet Union. This would have been before he was mayor of Toronto. That is totally different, Robert Ford, I'm afraid. Okay, all right. <laughs> this one was a poet, and we'll come back to that maybe a little bit later. So Robert Ford was a, actually Stalinist style of manager, but of course ended up pushing his wheelchair when he came for one of his last visits to Ottawa in the early 80s. And as a result of that, he intervened on behalf of the powers that be, so to speak, at foreign affairs and made sure that I would get the assignment in Moscow, which of course meant something that I thought was the most interesting part for me was to learn a foreign language. Learning Russian actually was, a, obviously, it's not the most productive part of my career, but the one that I enjoyed the most, being actually being on full-time language training was one of the most you know, pleasant things I could think of. Now, when you went there, there was a fantastic art collection at the embassy, was there, or was it already gone by then? Tell us about that. In the days after the Second World War, things were rather difficult in Moscow, and we ended up at the Canadian embassy with a local manager. The manager of the person in charge of administration at the embassy was a Soviet citizen of Greek origin, George Kostakis, who turned out to be a collector of fine art. The point is that, of course, because he had a steady job at, at a foreign embassy, Mr. Kostakis had a certain amount of cash at his disposal, and he was uh, well known in the circles of uh, sort of what you would call nowadays dissident painters. And of course, he Eventually, what happened is that people who were starving, actually, the starving artists living La Bohème, so to speak, would come to George Kostakis and would agree to sell a painting for the equivalent of a loaf of bread. And of course, uh, Kostakis, in this case, was actually allowing some people to survive throughout a very difficult period. So he ended up with a very rich collection of modern art, but of course, some, some of it extremely valuable. So what happened, of course, he, he, became, he became more famous than the ambassador himself. And the people would come to Moscow to speak to Mr. Kostakis to see his collection, which he had in a few places, including his apartment in Moscow and his dacha outside of Moscow. So he had 
a collection that to this day actually fills one of the Moscow museums, the New Tretyakov, what is referred to at times as the New Tretyakov. So if I understand you correctly, the core of the New Tretyakov Museum, which we've all visited many times, consists of paintings that used to hang in the Canadian embassy. Not well, they, they were never they never hung at the Canadian embassy. They were in Mr. Kostakis' private uh, dwelling. There was also something about the fact that this was not official. There was no official part to this in the sense that the items that Mr. Kostakis was collecting were regarded officially as trash, essentially. They did not meet the requirements of Soviet realism. So basically... We're talking about Kandinsky, we're talking about Malevich. Yes, uh, there were a few of those. So in fact, uh, Chagall also, a few of those that were left behind. Amazing. Kandinsky. Malevich, the painting that had been collected by individuals over the uh, the first part of the, ni- the 20th century. Kosakis has an eye, had an eye for it, but also was able to appreciate this. And of course, in this process, also, he was, he was perhaps the only person who was actually supporting the artistic community in that way. You said that uh, U.S. Senator Ted Kennedy came to Moscow. How did that go down? The um, Senator Kennedy came to Moscow, I think it was in the early 80s, very early 80s, or even before that. And when the, the, he was doing his program, he asked to see the Canadian embassy, but not the ambassador. He wanted to see the art collector. And I think <laughs> the ambassador did not take this very well because the ambassador thought of himself as he was at the time the dean of the diplomatic corps and had been serving quite a while in Moscow already. So we thought, you know, people will come to see the ambassador because he had the font of knowledge about and wisdom about Russia. But no, it was the Kostakis collection that was of greater interest to a person like Senator Kennedy. But of course, it was true also that the, the collection, I saw some of it. We had some meetings at, at the gallery in the mid 80s, and we, I ended up speaking with the person who was a curator of that collection at the museum. And of course, he was quite proud to show us what, what they'd been able to collect from Mr. Kosakis, because of course, there were all kinds of stories about that. Some of the collection made it to eventually outside of Russia, part, well, a small part of it. And Mr. Kosakis was able to do, I think, an exhibit in Athens at some point. Now, you said there was one embassy, one embassy that could actually smuggle paintings out, and we won't name the embassy, but there was uh, there was a group doing that, you said, right? There was indeed a, a small embassy in Moscow that was using the diplomatic bag to ship the works of one artist. You would claim to be surprised at some point that this Russian, not terribly well-known artist, would have uh, an exhibit opening in Europe somewhere. And you say, how did the paintings make it their way? Well, by some magic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that, that's the way it was done. But of course, the, there was a certain amount of, this was an official, and the people like to entertain a certain amount of cloak and dagger atmosphere around this. Basically, you know, of course, uh, not that these people were in trouble with the authorities, but they, they certainly were not well perceived by the official, official them, so to speak. So speaking of cloak and dagger, do you have any stories from your time? You've just told us about things that happened before you arrived. How about during your tenure, which was 1983 to 1986? Did you have any stories? Did anybody try to, to uh, approach you or cause you problems? There were, there were. I think it was very clever. There was, it strikes me that, you know, at times the way it is presented in the movies, how entrapment begins or it's done, it's rather crude. I think what the entrapment was, was a far more sophisticated way Way, so to speak. It's, uh, you know, people would come to you, of course, in the old Soviet Union, perhaps as in Russia today, to a certain extent, people like to say that nothing ever happens by accident. So if you, as a young man, end up sitting across a strikingly beautiful blonde woman in the aircraft for two hours, you know, is this an accident or is this something that was planned? Then, of course, you have to say, well, you know, when you find out that the person in question to know some things about you, that cannot be attributed to chance. Obviously, then you, you should start being suspicious in the sense that if someone starts, you know, offering you compliments that really are extremely well targeted. But of course, uh, as you know full well, Nathan, flattery will get you anything. Of course. <laughs> there is this element. So there was this case when in the early days we would travel outside of Moscow, I was able to travel to, to Riga already because, of course, it was uh, performing arts delegations coming to uh, from Canada to Russia. So there were some interesting events taking place. And of course, you then travel to see a representation, so to speak, a performance by Canadian artists, and then you get into a so kind of a, the atmosphere is quite different, so to speak. So there you go. I was offered to make contact with a group of uh, a so-called dissident artists and so on and so forth. So that was, I think, a case where you could say that, you know, a very clever way of trying to exert some influence on you. I don't, entrapment so, is so a woman sat next to you in the airplane and she was interested in a relationship? Or? Yes, absolutely. But of course, in those days, in the first rows of a, of a Soviet aircraft, you were not sitting side by side. You were sitting face to face. 
So it was, in, you know, you could not avoid having starting a conversation with the person in front of you because you were sitting knee to knee. It was very cleverly done, I think. Okay. Interesting. And what sort of things was she saying to you? Oh, flattery. Flattery in a very sophisticated, discreet way. But of course, you know, trying to sort of go after your, in, a, in my case, of course, clearly it was vanity. They probably knew that it would not be influenced by money or other things that normally are used in spy novels. But, uh, you know, vanity was one, well, the, the chink in the armor. So. <laughs> well, at the end of the day, you held fast, I'm sure, and did not get entrapped. Not that I know of. <laughs> okay. Now, tell us, during your time, a lot was happening from 83 to 86. Uh, regime change. What were the major events during your posting? I think in those days, there were the, what was striking, of course, it's difficult now to relate these things, but Mikhail Gorbachev had been to Canada and had brought back with him the person who had been the Soviet ambassador to Canada for 10 years, who was also a friend of Pierre Trudeau, Alexander Yakovlev. And then, of course, in that process, what we know now, of course, is that Alexander Yakovlev, who was a very, how to say, sharp intellectual intellect, actually started writing Gorbachev's speeches. And what you have to bear in mind is that the when this Gorbachev started making his sort of some of his most famous speeches, they were written by Alexander Yakovlev, and they would send tremors across the society in the sense that people who had been sort of living in this political environment for all their lives, all of a sudden heard something, somebody tell the truth and in a very elegant Russian way, actually, because Yakovlev was very literate also. So it was extremely, I would say, well put, uh, but it was also kind of, a, as I think I may have mentioned to you before, the, there were some people who, when they were finished listening to Gorbachev's speeches, were shaking in their boots. They were so, I would not say disturbed, but shocked by what they heard. They simply could not believe it and could see uh, the consequences. I mean, touching on all the, the sacred cows, so to speak, you know, saying things that could not be said before. So th this was really the transformation was taking place in front of our very eyes in terms of the, the dynamite was put in the in sort of at the bottom of the wall, so to speak, at that point. And uh, you could see the explosion was going to happen. So you would have been present at the death, at the funerals of at least two Soviet leaders. Yes, that's right. Of course, you, you may recall the story about this. Andropov passed away in, I think it was 1984, January February 1984. Yep. I managed to escape Moscow before the funeral, so I missed the Andropov funeral events. But, you know, thank God to the lifespan of uh, Secretary General of the Communist Party, within a year, another one passed away. Chernenko passed away the, the following year, and then I was involved in all of that, which was in those days uh, an occasion where world leaders would all come to Moscow, and some would, and them would end up, sort of, you know, waiting for a few, quite a long time in the corridors of the Canadian embassy, because, of course, every, everybody was trying to organize a meeting with someone. And, of course, for instance, we had Fidel Castro come to the Canadian embassy and was made to wait there for several minutes because before the then prime minister could come over and meet him. So it was like, you know, the, everybody, world leaders were just sort of going in their limousines around Moscow trying to set, schedule meetings, try to meet their counterparts. It was fascinating to watch in those days uh, of course, the funeral took the, was important, but after the person was put in the ground, everybody scrambled to have their meetings. Interesting, interesting. So you would have seen, you were, were witness to the first steps of Gorbachev and his first uh, speeches. Did you attend any Communist Party events? That's right. I was able to attend. I think it was the, not a lot of people would have attended these things, but I think it was the 25th part. I'm, I'm not sure the number, but there was a party congress that I was able to witness and attend. It was interesting to see the art discussions that were taking place because between some of the art liners uh, or the more conservative elements in the Communist Party in those days, and you could see that in some cases you had some individuals coming from the person who was at the time the first secretary of the Communist Party in Magadan, regarded as, as they used to see in those days, tough as nails. And he had totally different views. I mean, it was interesting to see that these people were speaking out in those days as well. I mean, part of the last nos in Perestroika was that we could also hear the voices of some of the more conservative elements in the Communist Party. For the first that. time. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yes. You could see that what it was revealing to you is that we always, uh, diplomats in those days were always trying to sort of decipher what was going on in the discussions of the Central Committee. You remember the famous sentence when uh, young people would say to Igor Rigachev, Tini Prav, you are not right. Something that was unthinkable. The slogan was sort of you know, circulating around about, you know, telling probably the most conservative element in the Politburo, yeah. you are wrong. Very, uh, very bold, to say the least. So you were in the Soviet Union from 83 to 86, yes. and you went back to kind of shut the country down from 89 to 91. What, uh, 
What happened during your second posting? And I think you had a yes. prime ministerial visit as well. We started, and the reason actually I was asked to go back to Moscow a second time, of course, we had a series of expulsions in the mid eight, well, late 80s, and I ended up being the one who was spared the, the expulsion thing. So I was asked to go back to Moscow on three weeks notice in uh, 1889 because the prime minister was coming. So we, st we started working on Prime Minister Mulroney, which was, I think, the first visit of a Canadian prime minister for 18 years. So it was a, a, an historical moment in the sense that, of course, we see the, all the right things. But of course, in those days, it was also a time when there was uh, things were changing as well across in and the rest of Eastern Europe. Of course, a little story that was never publicized is that, of course, Brian Mulroney, because he had been sort of a desired guest, as they say in Russian, was going to stay at the Kremlin. Three days before his arrival, we get a message saying there is a, a pipe that has broken in the Kremlin. And we will not be allowed, you know, we'll not be able to host your prime minister in the Kremlin. So we'll find him another place to stay as a, as a mansion outside outside of the center. So, of course, you know, nobody knew about this. The Canadian journalist didn't really like what was going on. But, of course, we found out later on, I was asked to do a report afterwards on not only the visit of Mulroney, but the visit of the prime minister Mazowiecki of Poland. And it turns out that, of course, lo and behold, it was Mazowiecki who had kicked out uh, Mulroney out of the Kremlin because, of course, at the last minute, the Soviet authorities agreed to receive Mazowiecki with all the honors that previously uh, extended to a Polish prime minister, even though Mazowiecki was the first non-communist prime minister of Poland. Whether you stay at the Kremlin or in the foreign ministry guest house is something that was actually decided by, by the prime minister of Russia. Interesting. I've never heard of world leaders being hosted in the Kremlin, but I guess back then they did that. It was reserved for, for, the, for the top ones, so to speak. And of course, it was quite the honor to have the Canadian prime minister offered this. There was a section, actually, we visited that part of the Kremlin, which was the guest for guests. Interesting. But of course, it was very, how to say, this, separated from the rest of the Kremlin. You could not, you could not run into the, sorry, no, the other part of the Kremlin that belonged to uh, you know, all the leaders. Now, you dealt with the press corps quite a bit there. Yes. Did you have any problem with the authorities uh, in relation to the press? No, in those days, I think we ended up, it was certainly there was a great deal of opening. At, at some point, you may recall that, uh, if you dress your memory a little bit, that at some point, there were, I think, up to nine, if not 10 Canadian journalists working in Moscow. In those days, Russia was so interesting that ma major news organizations would send their journalists to Moscow. So whereas today, I think we have two or three journalists. But in those days, I mean, it was nine and counting. People were doing, of course, reporting on what was going on in Russia. So of course, there were difficulties. A few, a few areas where if you got into them, you know, you, you, you would get uh, very direct criticism from the local authorities. But most of the time, journalists were allowed to do their things. Mm -hmm. I'm remembering you told a story about the fire marshal, that they, they had problem with your journalistic court. Oh, yes. Of course, the idea is that, of course, it has to do with corruption. But of course, Canadian journalists were offered first to stay at the Russia Hotel. And then some a better Canadian journalist explained to the world, he says, you know, we're going to go to Moscow and we're going to live broadcast from Moscow. I, I don't want to do this from any just regular hotel room. I want to do it from Red Square. I need the visuals. So I need to have, this is CBC News Moscow. I want to have the people see in the background St. Basil's, the Red Square. So basically, the way to do it was there was an, an area on the Hotel Russia. It was a balcony or a roof extension where you could put your cameras, direct view of Red Square. So basically, this famous Canadian journalist came around and said, you know, uh, refusing the Russia Hotel was a terrible mistake. So, you know, OK, we ended up actually doing a lot of uh, diplomatic work to try to get back into the Russia Hotel after we Russians knew that we'd sort of said it was a dump. So basically, we had to say, well, you know, we've changed our mind. We've seen the light of day. and We would really love to live in the Kremlin and work in the Kremlin. So what, I think it was CTV News at the time that decided to even run a studio from the 12th floor of the Russia Hotel with the beautiful background view of Red Square. And of course, at some point, because they, these cameras in those days required a lot of extra lighting, they put in a lot of extra lights. And then, of course, within a matter of a few, I got a panic call from the organizer of this CTV studio. And he says, you know, the fire marshal has come in and wants to shut us down because we're, you know, we're going to burn the place down. So no cell phones in those days. So you basically, you, you jump into a car, you go to the, to the hotel to see what needs to be fixed. And then I get there and they say, oh, we found a solution to the problem. We will have a fireman sit in our studio all the time so that, you know, if there is a fire hazard, he will spot it immediately. But what's the compensation? Well, of course, we will have to pay a salary 
for the time that he's working with us. So basically, <laughs> it was a way of disguising a bribe, a very, not a substantial bribe, but a bribe to the local fire marshal so that he could allow the studio to find An incentive payment, Jill, incentive. Yeah, oh yeah. But then, of course, what was amazing <laughs> is that, of course, the fireman was either sleeping or smoking in, in the studio, which was interesting. The smoking was not the best sort of thing for a fire marshal to do, so to speak. So you were there for three years. You left in 91. Did you see the fall of the Soviet Union or what did you do during your final year? No, I missed that. Okay. What did you do during your final year? I, I know you took a trip somewhere. Final year? No, that, not, oh, well, you know, the trips, the famous trip were not in those days. Most famous trip probably was the one that was done in 1986 by David Crombie, who was the Minister of Indian Affairs in those days in Canada. And we did a 25,000 kilometer trip across the Soviet Union where we were able to sort of show a um, barrier in the sense that we were able to, um, Mr. Crombie had brought it in some representative of the First Nations of Canada. So I think it was the first time that you could, in many decades, where a person f from a First Nation in Canada was able to speak with a person from a First Nation in, in Russia in a normal context, so to speak. So we had a, a member of parliament from the Canadian Arctic who came over and was able to go to places like uh, Magadan, Chukotka, and also Sakhalin Island and so on and so forth. So it was very interesting. And I think it was relevant because it is, this is what opened the door eventually to the Russian Association of uh, Indigenous Peoples of the North becoming a partner with our First Nations. This was also what led eventually to Brian Mulroney dropping a line about an Arctic Council in 1989. And this is what eventually led to the creation of the Arctic Council 25 years ago. Momentous events, momentous events. Tell us about your trip to Riga. Oh, that was a trip when, of course, at the time when the Soviet Union was collapsing, the Baltic states, in fact, they were outside of the Soviet Union morally and mentally already. So when you travel to a place like Riga, you, you would expect that there would be the, the security people would sort of keep an eye on you and so on and so forth. But, you know, it was already a different country. So we, Joe Clark was then foreign minister of Canada, had decided that we would have somebody from the Canadian embassy, at least one Baltic capital all the time. So we had a permanent presence in the Baltic region. So I delayed my travel there for a little while, but I eventually I went for Easter to stay in Riga. I went there with my family and was able to show my children. I think they still remember this now. They were very young. The bullet holes in the hotel where we were staying, where there'd been a confrontation between the riot police and the sort of nationalists in, in Riga, the people who wanted, who were battling for the independence the re regaining the independence of Latvia. So basically, this was the hotel where, where uh, some fighting had taken place. Very impressive for a young child to walk to the stairs to go to his bedroom and find out that this was uh, just a few days before the bullets had been sort of fired in this area. Wow. That's, that's something I've never showed my kids, I can tell you. <laughs> yes. So tell us about uh, your final posting. That would have been under Ralph Lesition, John Sloan, yes, 2008 yes. to 2012, I'm going to say. Is that right? Yeah, that was the most fascinating. Well, not the most fascinating part. I think, you know, one of the things about if you've been to a place like two years, two twice on a posting, you think you know it. And then, of course, what is interesting is that, you know, you discover new things. One of my friends was uh, posted at the same time as it was. She was posting in Paris on a second posting. And I was on my third posting in Moscow. So she writes me a message saying, oh, I love Paris. I love Paris. You know, it's great to be back in Paris and so on and so forth. So I'm trying to find a little reply that I could make to uh, my friend in Paris saying, if I say that I love Moscow, they'll, they'll bring me back to Ottawa. They say, you know, you're out of your mind. You know, who loves Moscow? You know, if you, <laughs> how can you compare Moscow to Paris? So I had to devise a form of word saying, okay, why is it that I like Moscow? My response was the following. Moscow, like Paris and London, is a very large metropolis of a large city. It's now becoming more modern. London and Paris are easy to love, but Moscow richly rewards those who make the effort to know it. And I think what was this is what uh, I think Ralph Lesition also would agree with that is that we, even though some of us were on second or third posting, we were discovering Moscow in a way because the city was far more open. So we were discovering things that had been there in our face, but we had not seen them. So basically, that was the, the fascinating part. It also people to a certain extent were extremely how to say, open in discussions, what I found in those days. So because of that, and you could see things, some things that were right beside the embassy, we did not even know existed. And we were given to see them, uh, some historical buildings, some cultural places, some even the place where Stalin's family were apparently kept. You would find out that this house that looked like nothing was actually a place where, you know, 
some members of the family had been thrown out at some point. And people would tell you these things. And then, of course, realize afterwards, maybe they shouldn't have said that. So basically, it was a rediscovery. And I think also in those days, what we found is that uh, because, of course, there were no obstacles to relations, you would get access to everyone and anyone in all that you wanted to speak to in Moscow. It was fascinating to know what was going on. I think that this is, a, how to say, to understand. One of the things also that, and of course, nowadays, it's, it's common to, uh, to talk about uh, women's rights and so on and so forth. And there was a lot that in those days also, you would find out finally that, of course, Official history doesn't leave a lot of space to women. But of course, you would find out more about the fact that, in fact, some of the, the women who had been very important, but had not been so visible. What, what women are you thinking of? Mrs. Khrushchev. Uh-huh. In the Soviet time, they were not visible. But you would, you would find out how important they were, actually, in terms of you know, their influence. Now, I understand that you were one of the first uh, Westerners to meet the new patriarch in Moscow. Is that right? That's right. Uh, Ralph Lysician actually was the one. We thought it was very relevant to have this conversation in the sense that, uh, again, that was also patriarch uh, from his position, of course, very close to power, is a very, how do you say, uh, deep understanding of the what's going on in society. So it was breaking the barriers. Of course, also, we were having, in those days, people forget, we were having conversations as well with the security services. Really? Yes. With the Russian security services? Absolutely. Interesting. I didn't know that. So you had such a long and illustrious diplomatic career. It's just fascinating the things you're telling us. Um, what made you turn to business? Why, yes. why, uh, why are you the national chairman of Serba today? What, uh, what got you interested in Serba? I was in, ran into a meeting uh, by accident and then got roped into Serba. But I think also to some of us who have been serving in the Soviet Union in Russia, conclusions we've come to is that the potential for cooperation between Russia and Canada is immense. And we've seen it on the ground, what is possible, the dispositions of the Russian vis-a-vis Canada, how they've been, to a certain extent, looking at Canada for so many years. In some cases, of course, in the early days, we saw that some people in, in Russia knew Canada better than we did, in the sense that they know exactly what we've been up to in terms of, you know, Northern economic development, for instance, agriculture and whatnot. They knew Deeply held conviction, is that the right word? Not conviction, belief. That um, conviction is a different word. Uh, belief that, you know, there is so much to be done here in terms for the, for the better good, so to speak, of Russia and of Canada. So, you know, we, we can see the desirability of the developing these connections, business connections, trade investment between Canada and Russia, because, of course, they, they how to say, the greater good, so to speak. And nowadays, of course, this, has, this means more things like, you know, for instance, the sustainable development, green technologies, those things that are relevant in the context of the difficult cold weather conditions in which we operate. So basically, you, you, once you realize that, you say, well, this is, there is so much to be done here and we can do it for the greater good, so to speak, of the two countries. And of course, it's, it's also uh, I would say, an interesting thing to, to work with people who are, uh, I would say, extremely I would say, dedicated. So basically, you, know, you, you understand these things. Well, we're all dedicated. There can be no doubt of that. Tell us now, Serba has a big event coming up. This fall, what what is that all about? We um, what we find also over time is that in order to nurture this trade and investment, we need to have what I would call proper conversations. So I think we need to have a, a regular conversation with our counterparts and our partners to see where we are going in this, in the sense that you know to position ourselves, but also to influence our partners in the in the right direction in, in sort of towards greater cooperation. So. Canada Russia Business Council is an event where we bring our stakeholders and people who have an already an interest or may be looking at Russia. And of course, also that involves, you know, business people and government. And we try to sort of, you know, create a situation where we have this, I would call it a productive conversation about how, how to move things along, so to speak. You know, what needs to be done, where we can focus our action. Because of course, to this day, of course, you know, development of trade between Canada and Russia needs to be as it is also with Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and the other countries' region, uh, needs to be nurtured. It does not come so naturally. So I'll ask you a double question. What are the greatest opportunities for Canadian uh, Eurasian economic cooperation, whether we're talking about Russia or Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan or another country in the region? And what are the greatest limiting factors 
opportunities. I think, we, you know, of course, you have to reco- re- then fall back on our traditional sectors. When I started working on things Russian in Moscow, we initiated the sort of Canada, Russia, Canada, USSR Arctic Science Exchange, and we were already working in areas like construction, geology, agriculture, people to people contact. So basically, you know, the areas in which we operate, if you want, are, have not changed that much since 1984 in the sense that we, we work in things like natural resources, agriculture. And of course, there is this element of new technology and information technology. And of course, also green technology and so on. But the sense is that because fundamentally the challenges are the same in some of these great large areas, we are in a position to cooperate. But I would say also what I've observed over time is that to a certain extent, Canadian industry is, con- con- is functions a certain way. We have a lot of trade with the United States, of course, historically and traditionally. And a lot of our trade consists of a supporting parts, so to speak, in terms of the U.S. economy. So we no longer have these huge plants, of course, in Canada, perhaps deindustrialized. But our economy is kind of integrated in offering um, sort of services and goods to the U.S. economy, to a very large economy. To a certain extent, what we can see is that we are also in a position to play that same role vis-à-vis the, the growing Russian economy in the sense that we are not going to sort of, know, we may in some cases export large number goods. For instance, in the same thing like you know, DRP, for instance, exports goods to Russia because there is, there is a niche for that. There is a certain niche. But, but of course, but a lot of our work means that we are playing a, a part in terms of uh, what is not always recognized as a, as a very large and diversified economy. We can sort of know, play the same the same role, so to speak, in terms of so, you know, the technology solutions, the innovation that we offer to our American neighbors. Tell me this, in 30 seconds or less, what made you a leader, Gilles? Oh, I think I mentioned it already. It's these conversations. It's the, you know, what needs to happen is communication in the sense that, of course, you have to listen, you know, listen first, say, being able to listen and listen to, to understand and to respect what is said. You know, respect is also a very important element. I would hate to use the word empowerment, but I think that comes along as well eventually. Not always in the same the, the same way, but if you listen, you will be in a better position to empower. I agree. Listening is very important and it's something that people don't do enough of these days. I have to agree with you. What uh, what does the future hold for Gilles Breton? You've you've had an illustrious career. You're contributing to Serba in a fabulous way. What what is what are your future plans? Well, I think uh, to go on, actually, I mean, uh, the sense is that, of course, nowadays, uh, because of the, the way the, the world is unfolding, I think we see that even people like us, Nathan, who are a bit older, we need to sort of keep going, so to speak. And I think there is this element, uh, there is something very satisfying about giving back, so to speak. You know, you spent your life trying to learn something, a responsibility, a duty, but also it's a pleasure to do it, to, well, say, to give back in terms of what you've learned and what also not just what you've learned, but what other people have taught you. People have shared their experiences with you and sort of trained you, you know, made you a better person. Well, then you have to, to give back, so to speak. So I think that is you know, what needs to go on in the sense that if you've worked with people who were extremely knowledgeable, extremely respectful, and also that were able to sort of make you grow, it's not just you. You have to, so to say, to give back what you received. Well, I can tell you, as a former national chair of Serba, I can tell you that we all tremendously appreciate what you give back. We appreciate the time and effort that you uh, invest into the association, your excellent connections in Ottawa, which have been uh, uh, of no small import over the past four years during your tenure. And we look forward to uh, continuing work with you as, as time goes on. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Nitin. All the best. I have been joined today by Gilles Breton, Canadian diplomat extraordinaire who served three terms at the Canadian Embassy in Moscow from 83 to 86, 89 to 91, and 2008 to 2012. He currently serves as the chairman of the National Board of Directors of the Canada Eurasia Russia Business Association, and he's uh, a great friend and a great individual. Thank you so much, Gilles. Thank you, Nathan. You've been listening to Icebreakers, the podcast produced by Serba, a nonprofit business association supporting trade, investment, and good relations between Canada and the countries of Eurasia. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to the show and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. 
You can join our LinkedIn group to send questions to guests and find more information about the podcast series in general on our website at www.serbanet.org. Thanks for tuning in.